Mark and Chris, that was awesome. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. And good morning to you who are online. So we are continuing with our series of Unlikely Heroes. And unlike Mark's story of the Samaritan woman at the well, this unlikely hero does have a name. As I begin to tell you a bit about him, see if you can guess who I'm talking about. He did not come from a noble or important family, and there's no early record of his life. We do know he was a Jew, and he was called Levi. That was his Jewish name. He was also known by another name. And you might recognize that one as our story progresses. He was living in Capernaum, near the Sea of Galilee, about the time of Christ, and was probably in his 30s when we first hear about him in the Bible. And he was, have you guessed it? A tax collector. Tax collecting at the time of Jesus was one of the most, if not the most, despised profession in ancient Israel. The Jews despised them because they worked for the Romans, who were hated by the Jews. Not only did they work for their Roman masters, but they were backed by the emperor himself. Many of the taxes levied on the Jews were unfair, and the tax collectors themselves were mostly dishonest crooks. They took money for Rome, and they pocketed money for themselves, and there was nothing the Jews could do about it. The ordinary people had very little protection from them and simply had to pay what they demanded. Unlike today, tax collectors didn't sit in an office and wait for you to file your tax return. Instead, they would go from door to door, accompanied by Roman soldiers, and demand payment on the spot. And so if you were confronted by some Roman soldiers, you clearly paid up. It was not uncommon for a tax collector to invent tax codes to benefit himself, or for a person to be forced to pay the same tax twice in one day. Nice people, aren't they? Some would set up booths in commercial areas to tax the merchants and the traders and the customers passing by. And this is where we meet our unlikely hero. Let's look at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9 and verse 9. As Jesus went out from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he said. And Matthew got up and followed him. What an incredible response. Two little words that changed his life. He doesn't question, he simply obeys. In abandoning his post at the booth, he left a very profitable livelihood behind and with no fixed plan for the future, and with absolute trust and confidence, he follows Jesus. Do you remember the first two disciples Jesus called? They did exactly the same thing, left their nets to follow him. How long did it take you to follow Jesus? Were you prepared to leave your old life to follow him? Or are you still spending all your time sitting in your tax booth or mending your nets or doing your own thing 
and fitting him in when you've got some time? What has it cost you? What have you given up? How much of your life have you given to him? I want you to think about this. You may want to make some adjustments in your life to place him at the center. So why don't you just take a moment between you and the Lord and think about those questions. What it really means to you to follow him. Have you really left your old life behind? Have you really paid the price? And you might want to talk to Jesus about it. You might want to make a little note of your journal or a little comment on your phone. I'll just give you a minute or two. I hope you won't forget those questions and maybe take them home with you this week and think about them. The story goes on in Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 and 11. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? After accepting Jesus' invitation, invitation, Matthew holds a banquet to celebrate his new direction in life. How did you react when you gave your life to Jesus? Did you celebrate? The text says that the party was attended by Capernaum's most sinful and the religious elite. The first thing that strikes me is what were the Pharisees doing there? They should never have been mixing with tax collectors and sinners. It is possible they were friends of Matthew's, but it is more likely they had come to see what Jesus was doing and to find a way to disgrace him. The fact that Matthew's friends were sinners suggests that he himself had questionable morals. When you imagine the cultural stigma of his profession and the questionable nature of his friends, you can begin to understand the scandal his calling was. This rabbi, becoming a disciple of a rabbi, or teacher was a great honor that was not just given to anyone. As one of the most famous teachers of his day, Jesus' decision to call a man like Matthew undoubtedly confounded many. Matthew became a follower of Jesus, but that alone didn't make him a hero. And so... I'll let Mark tell you that part. Part two. What makes Matthew a hero, in my eyes, is that he took the time and made the effort to write an account of the life of Jesus. And it wasn't a short account. It's actually the longest of the four Gospels. Matthew went from tax collector to theologian. That's the hero that he is, from tax collector to theologian. 
Matthew, being a tax collector, would have had training in scribal techniques to keep accounts and make records of his day-to-day -day transactions, recording details that were important to him and to the Roman government. Transferring those skills to writing an account of the life and works of Jesus, looking at details that others might have overlooked, would not have been too difficult for him to do. But it would have taken time and effort. Matthew, being a Galilean Jewish Christian, would suggest that he had the ability to interpret the words and actions of Jesus in the light of the Old Testament messianic expectations. He was a Jew. He understood the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, to him the Scriptures. And he was able to see how Jesus fitted into those um, messianic expectations. His account of Jesus of Nazareth is a compelling witness that Jesus is the long-anticipated Messiah who brought the kingdom of God to earth and is the prophesied fulfillment of God's promise of true peace and deliverance of both Jew and Gentile. The ESV study Bible notes say the following about Matthew and the gospel he wrote. Matthew crafted his account to demonstrate Jesus' messianic identity, his inheritance of the Davidic kingship over Israel, and his fulfillment of the promise made to his ancestor Abraham to be a blessing to all the nations. Matthew 1.1 says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Just these huge gaps between Jesus, David, Abraham. But he's covering all those in between as well. Genesis 12, verses 1 to, 1 to 3 says, Now the Lord said to Abram, it was Abraham's name before God changed it, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. But Matthew was not just writing to the Jews. It is believed that he was writing to the church in Antioch. Antioch of Syria. There's two Antiochs if you look at your, your maps from, from Scripture. There's two Ma uh, Antiochs. Antioch of Syria. Um, in which there were many Gentile Christians. The SV study Bible notes go on to say, Thus, in large part, Matthew's gospel is an evangelist, evangelistic tool aimed at his fellow Jews, persuading them to recognize Jesus as their long-awaited Messiah. At the same time, the gospel reveals clearly to Gentiles that salvation through Jesus the Messiah is available to all nations. For Jewish Christians, Matthew's gospel provides encouragement to stand steadfast amid opposition from their own countrymen, as well as Gentile pagans, secure in the knowledge of their citizenship in God's kingdom. Matthew, as a tax collector, would have known what it was like to be despised and opposed by his fellow Jews, as well as the Gentiles in Israel that he had to tax. Matthew, as a follower of the way, as the early disciples of Jesus Christ were called, would have been opposed by the Jews who didn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah, and the Romans who had Caesar and their myriads of God, which we saw many of them while we were in Rome this past week. Against the backdrop of such opposition to Jesus' message, Matthew establishes the identity of Christ's church as the true people of God who now find their unity in service to Jesus, despite previous racial, class, and religious barriers. His gospel provides necessary instruction for all future disciples, Jew and Gentile, who form a new community centered upon devotion and obedience to Jesus the Messiah amid significant opposition. When Matthew was writing, there was still huge opposition to the Christian faith. It was new, it was growing, but it was hugely opposed. 
As Jill said in the beginning, that there is very little known about the early life of Matthew. There's also very little known about the latter years of his life. He's mentioned once in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. This is just after Jesus has ascended to heaven. It says, Then they returned to Jerusalem, that's the disciples, from the, from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. He gets mentioned then. And we don't really hear much more after that. Well, Little to nothing is known of his missionary journeys or the churches he founded. Most of what we know today is extrapolated from the many stories about his ministry to the Gentile world. There, is historic, there are historical documents of him traveling, but not a lot. According to the legend, Matthew could have visited various places throughout his life, including Persia, the Caspian Sea, Ethiopia, Parthia, Macedonia, and even Syria. Most records talk about him doing the typical apostolic thing over the course of his travels, like miracles, preaching the gospel, and founding churches. Though there is little agreement about his accomplishments or missionary itinerary, most sources agree that his journey ended with martyrdom in Ethiopia. According to church tradition, Matthew was martyred in Ethiopia around the year 60 A.D., And what was amazing when we were in in Rome now and when we went on trips and the guides were there talking to you, they all spoke about before Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ or after Jesus Christ. They mentioned him so much. And it's just incredible to hear that being spoken all the time. So 60 years AD, if you know what AD stands for. Um, However, in typical fashion, all the records have conflicting stories about how and where it happened. The tales about his death include burning, stoning, stabbing, beheading, and even old age, although that is um, sort of written off by most people that he didn't die of old age. One of the most popular stories about his death is preserved in a book called The Golden Legend. In the legend, Jesus sends Matthew to Ethiopia, where he enjoys a long, fruitful ministry. However, after Matthew rebukes King Herticus during a service, Things go south very fast. The local king, Matthew, says something to him that upsets him. The king orders one of his soldiers to kill Matthew, who, without hesitation, stabs the apostle with his sword. Matthew offended the king of Ethiopia. The king of Ethiopia orders his death. A soldier carries it out. Unlike the high-ranking followers of other religious founders, uh, the apostles were unconcerned with their legacy. Their mission was to bring the gospel to the world, not build monoliths to themselves. That's why you never really see statues of them unless you go into some of the the churches where they have put up statues of them, but nothing outside for everyone to see. Before running into Jesus, Matthew was the kind of person others would write off as unfixable. How many of us were were thought to be like that? Or how many people have you heard of the stories, heard their testimonies of them being looked at as unfixable, those drug dealers or the murderers or the you know, people in prison whose lives change and turn around when they encounter Jesus Christ? And yet in three short years, he was transformed into the sort of individual God could trust his gospel to. From this person who was seen to be unfixable becomes one who is touched by Jesus over a three-year period, and later on in his life, he writes the account. Obviously inspired by the Holy Spirit, he writes the account of his time with Jesus and the story of Jesus. We ought to be grateful to Matthew, the unlikely hero, who gave us the opening book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew. Sorry, I'm lost. The last page is all muddled up. Cool. There we go. I've got it, got it, got it. <laughs> it was right at the back. Matthew, under the leading of, of, of God, the Holy Spirit, 
used the gifts, talents, and the skills that he had learnt as a tax collector to write an account of the life, mission, and ministry of Jesus Christ so that others would be able to come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. Matthew learnt these skills and he used those skills and those gifts to write this account for us, for our benefit and for the benefit of all those who have gone before us and those that are coming after us. How are you using your gifts, talents and learnt skills to reach out to others with the good news of Jesus Christ? What gifts, what skills have you learnt or have you been given and how are you using those to reach out to others with the good news of Jesus Christ? Amen. Some discussion questions. And as, as I said in the beginning, let's discuss them and then let's leave the prayer time for after, um, after our worship again and minister, we'll have it during the ministry time there. First question, what stood out for you in this message? Second one, share briefly how you became a disciple of Jesus Christ. And if you're not there yet, don't worry. If you're on that journey, it's a journey you are on. And um, just ask or share with people where you are on your journey. And then thirdly, as Jill mentioned earlier, what changes did this bring about in your life, in your journey to becoming a disciple? When you became a disciple, what changes did this bring about in your life? And then last one, just a repeat of the question I've just asked you. How are you using your gifts, talents, and learned skills to reach out to others with the good news of Jesus Christ? So we've got 20 minutes to discuss that. For those of you who are watching online, thank you for being with us. And if you're with someone, I trust you will discuss these questions between you. And uh, thank you.